we are now beginning our parallel session in this room. My name is Thomas Thurem. I'm coming from the Threshold Association and representing the Abilis Foundation based in Finland, Helsinki, but we work globally quite all over the world. And uh, I was actually, I'm, I'm very happy that I'm not able to speak without the podium because last week I was in an event where the only way to give a speech was from behind the podium and nobody was able to see me there from there because um, I'm a rather short person, but then again, for a shy individual, it's actually a very safe way to give your speech from behind the counter, so you won't be bothered. Now, um, I would like to thank the Essel Foundation for inviting us, and one of the inspirations for today's sessions was, I think, the topic discussed in the previous couch debate, which I think it's rather relevant that if we look where we are in terms of disability and participation, we do have quite a way to go in the terms of inclusion people with disabilities themselves. Uh, I have often used this example that let's say there would be a conference of women's employment, advancing women's employment in leadership and it would be all male panel. Or there would be a conference assessing the needs of LGBT community in certain circumstances, and there would be 50 member expert panel with no people from the LGBT community. Everyone would be outraged. Everyone would be, where are, where are the women? Where are the uh, representatives of the LGBT community? But what my organization, Abilis, has always targeted is that it's vital to find allies in the non-disabled community, but in order to keep, we keep repeating the term of nothing about us without us, I think we should go deeper into considering the meaning. Uh, one of the things that my organization has tried to do in the Global South in this regard, that we, when we give scholarship or we act as a donor or we run projects, we are adamant that there are disabled people themselves running the show, at least, you know, uh, in, in high capacities. And we have noticed that often when you suggest that uh, let's include the disabled themselves here. They said, oh, we can't find qualified disabled. Qualified disabled people are not there. Then we say, okay, this project won't get funding unless the people you hire are disabled. Next day, they found the disabled. You have to create the so-called incentive. And especially in the foreign policy areas, I think we are, we are quite in a limbo in the terms that often when we recruit, we require much expertise and much experience. You have to be expert on this field, that field, have relevant work experience for six years. And then people with disabilities are not hired because they do not possess these qualities. At the same time, we do, how do we level the playing field? If you are re required a certain qualification as a disabled person to be a policymaker, then we should create a platform where you can actually be the policymaker themselves. So when we talk about self-advocacy, what we would like to highlight is that we can't talk about self-advocacy unless we create the so-called grassroots opportunities for people to participate. And it also comes down to our model of development where we target the so-called micro and weak organizations to create the civil society for people with disabilities because it, it doesn't come from nowhere. So I'm really happy we were able to arrange session regarding self-advocacy. Now, uh, I would like to introduce you to Petra. So the model we are going to use today is that after each, we have distinguished presentators here, and after each presentation, we'll have a graphic summary of key points of their presentation. And Petra will be in charge of this. So this is just so everyone will be allocated about nine minutes presentation. Afterwards, we will make a summary. And. Uh, so the first presentation for, would be from Light of the World and Mr. David Curtis. Yeah, can I this one? Yeah. 
Good afternoon. I'll turn it on. It will help. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. We're absolutely delighted, and we give a lot of thanks to the organisers of the conference for letting us come here and share a few words about Cambodia. My name is David Curtis. I work for Light for the World in Cambodia, and I'll be presenting today with my friend and colleague, Mr. Sam Nang Peng, also from Cambodia. We'll, we'll share the presentation. Yeah. So, okay. Good afternoon. So, communication for advocacy. Um, this is really, it's, it's, it's as it says, it's a program that focuses on building advocacy skills, self-advocacy skills, and it focuses on the, the power of communication in order, in order to do that. Um, this came about because everywhere we went in Cambodia, we, we have a few different projects in Cambodia, and in uh, the rural areas especially, Cambodia is 80% agricultural still, still a poor country. We still have a, a legacy of the war and lots of landmine survivors. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a largely rural country, so we have our own specific context. Everywhere we went, we heard that people with disabilities didn't have a voice, especially in the rural areas, not so much the cities, but the rural areas. Um, they didn't have access to their rights, they didn't have access to participate, etc. We heard this anecdote, we heard it anecdotally everywhere we went, but we needed to really find some proof for that so that we could back up our, our projects, go to donors, and really use this as, as fact. So this project has three components, really. There's skills building in advocacy and communication. There's also setting up structures for sus sustainability for people to organize. And there's also a research component to it, which I'll talk about in a, in, in a bit. I'm not speaking too fast. No? I come from London, and I'm always told I speak too quickly. But, oh, is this the next slide? OK. So I mentioned briefly that the main issue was a communication gap. And the gap was between people with disabilities and local authorities. Not always done by intention, but done because that, that's, that's just our, our reality. Um, the line of administration goes between communities or citizens to village level, then village level to commune level, commune level to district, and district to province. We've worked on this project on one province, so we're going deeper, but just in one, in one province itself. Um, people with disabilities often lack the advocacy and communication skills to raise the issues that affect them, and equally the authorities often are unsure how to reach or include the very people that they, they should be including. Okay, um, usually information at local level comes around through the village meetings, through commune meetings, through public announcements. Um, that's all well and good, but most people that we spoke to with disabilities don't necessarily attend those meetings, so they don't get that information. They're not participating in those kind of consultations. And a really large percentage, nearly all, said that their existing way that they got information was not easy for them. So even, even getting information itself was, was challenging. Okay, um, people often reported that they didn't attend meetings, not just because they weren't invited or hadn't been included, but sometimes were made to feel unwelcome or unvalued. So they remained being un uninformed. There's a, a quote from a, a woman in our, um, in our project area who was recently widowed, and she was talking about her children, her older children. So she says here, two of my children are now in their 30s. They are intellectually disabled and, and do not speak. They don't have ID cards. There was a session in the village once. Um, they were trying to get everybody to have a, an ID card. And they really wanted to get the two older children registered, but the village chief advised against it. He said, there's no point doing that because look at who they are. You, you don't need to get them registered. So you can see this whole kind of communication, the information thing, really, it really filters through. 
Um, now, I'm going to be a bit quicker. So, Light for the World has been working in Cambodia for about 20 years. We've had an office there for the last three years. This project itself is focused in the province of Persat, which is on the Thai border, a heavily landmined, poor uh, rural province. I'm going to pass over to my friend now, Mr. Sam Nang from DDSP, the local organization, to say a bit more about the project specifically. Thank you, Sam Nang. Thank you, David. Thank you for the uh, great opportunity. Yeah, you can see from the PowerPoint, um, local, local authority has been uh, selected, both at the village level and also commune level. At the first year of the project, um, 22 uh, commune disability representatives and 229 village uh, disability representatives have been selected to work for inclusive development in the coverage area. Um, also, like the CDR, the, the, the Commune Disability Representative and the Village Disability Representative, their role was to meet with and collect information from persons with disabilities in the villages, for example, by meeting with the person with disability at their home and organize village uh, planning meetings. Then bring up any issue that uh, needed to be addressed to be the commune disability representative. And then the com commune disability representative would present these issues in commune council meetings to see if they are uh, to be addressed. If necessary, the uh, commune disability representative um, bring up the issue up uh, in higher government level, for example, um, district level and provincial level. Not only advocacy, um, some, other, some other important activity also uh, apply for the, um, for the project, for example, data collection for evidence-based advocacy, uh, participation village action plan, lobby commune planning and budgeting, support commune uh, council on disability data management, um, training capacity building to commune disability representatives and commune council also uh, are, are conducted. Um, public forum and workshop consultation and network, uh, uh, network meeting also organized. Further, uh, referral for persons with disability also conducted. Here is the new information flow. Um, persons with disability now uh, can raise their issue um, to village disabled uh, representative and upper um, level. For example, commune disability representative, district community representative, and up to the provincial representative. Provincial level, thank you. Here is an example only. Um, this said that uh, yeah, the project uh, has been researched that a uh, uh, seven years old Miss Chichen who is blind in one eye and has had polio live with her disabled son and three granddaughters in a small, in a small leaking cottage in Bosat. It was very difficult to stay there, especially during the raining season and night time. We can't sleep at all and feel unsafe and worried about my granddaughters because the house is written everywhere. The, and also, yeah, I pass on to my, uh, yeah, to David, uh, yeah, to myself about the impact, thank you. Okay. Um. We're just, we're just closed by, by looking at some of the impact where, where issues have been raised and they've been able to be dealt with. The communication flow has been two ways. We haven't been completely successful, but some of the things that have worked have been issues around getting people assistive devices when they've really needed them, not having a huge wait for years. Um, lobbying local commune premises to be accessible, including latrines, so people are more likely to visit and participate. 
the, they can participate more. Working with local health centres around sexual and reproductive health rights for women and girls with disability and being part of emergency response where they would often slip through the gaps. But basically it's raising issues until they're dealt with and there's some kind of accountability through the two-way communication structure. So I just close really by saying it started out as an advocacy issue and it's, it, it's really a communication issue. It's the communication that matters. Thank you. Okay. Pet yeah, Petra. Yeah. Yeah. So, as we, those who ha might have joined us later, after each presentation, we'll have a short graphic summary by Mrs. Petra Plicke. Yes, coming up. So, it's quite short, and the camera should show you my drawings that are not very colorful yet, but they will be. Um, what we heard from Cambodia was the project governed by Light of the World, that what most of the issues, this is the summary here, okay, <laughs> most of the issues are that people with disabilities um, are not informed well, um, they don't have a voice, so the main focus was on that gap of communication between people with disabilities and their wants and needs and um, authorities. Um, we also see the problem that because most of the participative um, activities take place on a village level. So um, I heard that people with disabilities are either not invited to those meetings saying like they don't understand, they cannot take part. And there are also barriers to access to these meetings. So one of the solutions was to make those meetings more inclusive and we saw a picture where people were taking part and raising their hands. Uh, another way was to collect information, data, on people with disabilities and include this information in planning and capacity building when it comes to legal uh, issues for people with disabilities. So what we can say is we have involvement of experts on disability um, on all levels from the community up to the government. And the impact that we see is more participation and it's not on the picture yet, but it's all about communication is what we heard. So the communication gap is closing and that will be the final picture here after that session. Thank you. Wow. I, I mentioned to Petra when we met, I actually have a friend in Finland who is the first person professionally in Finland to do this for a living, and this was really impressive. Um, so, uh, our next speaker will be Mr. Uh, Zambriano Olomedo, and now we didn't have time for any introduction round in the, in the beginning, so if you want at the beginning of your speech, just in one, one or a couple of sentences, describe a little bit your background organization that you're representing here. Thank you. Like this. My presentation is there now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, greetings from Ecuador. Uh, thanks for the Zero Project, the opportunity to share our experience. Um, I work in, at the Foundation Discapacidad y Desarrollo, Disability and Development Foundation a non-profit uh, NGO based in southern Ecuador that works for the inclusion of persons with disabilities. I am going to present our experience in the co-creating disability law, laws um, with local governments. Uh, we work in four municipalities uh, where about 60,000 people live. Uh, these municipalities are characterized by poverty and negative population growth uh, because uh, of the high flow of migration of young people to other cities of Ecuador for work uh, or studies. Disability and Development Foundation uh, implements a community 
Uh, Disability and Development uh, Foundation implements a community-based inclusive development project supported by CBM and the municipalities of uh, Calvas, Espindola, Gonzalama, and Sosoranga. The project uh, seeks to reduce the marginalization of persons with disabilities, empowering and <clears throat> developing their capacities, and promoting access to services. We work together uh, in community networks, uh, networks uh, make up of persons with disabilities, local governments, and savers available in the community. Uh, such as health, education, work, transport, and the legal system. Uh, as part of the Minga project, Minga uh, means working together in Quichua, a native uh, language of Ecuador. <clears throat> as part of the Minga project, we promote a community-based development of local affirmative action laws for persons with disabilities. Uh, we started uh, by looking for information about the needs and the dream also uh, of persons with disabilities. Uh, then we drafted the laws with the participation of at least 500 uh, persons with disabilities from the four municipalities. It was uh, the persons with disabilities themselves who presented these laws to the city council so that the laws could be approved. Now, um, and the most important thing for us, uh, the organizations of persons with disabilities themselves are promoting the implementation of these laws. Uh, I am showing a photo, a session of approval of uh, articles of municipal law in Spindola municipality. The people are raising their hands in sign of approval of a part of the law. The main impacts of these projects have been the empowerment of persons with disabilities. For example, uh, four new organizations of persons with disabilities were created. The possibility of many persons with disability to work for example, uh, more than 450 persons uh, with disabilities has now a small business and a job contract. The awarenesses of the community, uh, much of this, the service are now accessible. For example, all uh, health service in the municipalities now have basic accessibility. And persons with disabilities have tax and transport discounts. I am showing now uh, two photos. Maria is now making jams since uh, she received support for her small business. Jose is working in building houses, receiving a decent salary. CBM uh, support ends in March of this year, next month. Uh, from the beginning of this year, uh, three of the municipalities are taking the total technical and financial uh, responsibility of the project. But we want uh, to work in other municipalities because we are sure that the project uh, can be implemented uh, elsewhere. The key point is empowerment of persons with disabilities and we, requ we require uh, less than 30,000 euros per year for implement our project in one municipality. Not only the, the co-creating laws uh, process, but all the CBID project, community-based inclusive development. If you want more information, you can ask me. I can, I can give you a uh, little information in Spanish about our experience in local governments and disability. Thanks. Okay, and now we move to the summary. And to those who might have joined during the presentation, we'll have, after each presentation have a short summary.
technical problems for all of us are the same, I guess. <laughs> so, um, in Ecuador, we heard that um, the main focus of your project was on co-creating solutions for people with disabilities to hear their uh, wishes and their wants and needs and to create together with government solutions including a local affirmative action based on laws, so legally binding uh, affirmative action. Um, what we see as a result is that people with disabilities, um, again, are actively participating in decision-making, especially community-based. So in, within the communities, people are invited, they raise their hand and they give their voice, um, which results in two things I, I heard was empowerment of people with disabilities and one thing was also the tax reduction, um, just as one of the results, but there is a lot more, just as a brief summary of, of what you said. And uh, so our next presenter is also from Ecuador, so Mr. Daniel Salas. And if you can, at the beginning, tell a little bit about your background organization you're representing here at the Zero. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm from Ecuador, too. It's a little country, but with a lot of show, things to show. I'm from FEPAPDEM, one of the five national federations for disability and we work with the intellectual disability. Uh, today, I want to tell you how from a small country and a small project, we significantly change the quality of life of a group of people with intellectual disabilities. With them, we have a, a direct impact on the creation of pol public policy. In this way, we seek solution for all people with intellectual disability in Ecuador. The Ecuadorian Federation of People with Intellectual Disability and their families, FEPAPDEM is the organization, carries out the project. We are an organization that includes 55 associations of people with intellectual disability and we have a national representation. We have 31 years of work providing guidance and service to our partners. However, our incidence in public policy was small until a few years ago. It was uh, common for both relatives, especially mothers, and professionals to insist that the state should make change to be more inclusive. We tried to talk to the authorities, and normally the door was closed, or, or requests were not here. After reflecting deeply, we understood that neither parents nor professionals could fully transmit the needs of people, of people with disability. Something was lost along the way. The strength and the urgency of those who suffered the barriers or lack of opportunity were lost. It was that moment that together with the people with disability, we decided to take the training of our safe advocates with total seriousness. It will be them and only they who will transmit their own message, but they had to be trained and ready so that their message reaches the highest level. First, we trained uh, the facilitator, facilitators. We put a lot of emphasis on teaching them to sit still and, not, and only act when asked by the person with disability. We teach them to put aside our protection and allow them to learn from their mistakes. Then it was the turn of the self-advocates. They learned about their rights, but also about their obligations. They learned to make decisions and to take responsibility for the consequence of these decisions. They learned to speak for themselves and for others in their same condition. From there, they were the ones that marked the way. They wanted society to change, and we create a good practice conference where they told how they triumphed in different areas and were heard by the government. 50 self-advocates from seven countries participated in this event. The experience was wonderful. They talked about education, health, work, and social inclusion. 
This happened four years ago. At the, at the end of the event, they decided that they had to keep working, decide to make their own association and monitor their needs. It took us three years, but today we have the first legally constituted association of Ecuador and Latin America that is formed exclusively by persons with intellectual disability. They are now the bosses. They make the decisions. They meet with authorities and they explain the things that they need. The authorities listen to them in other way. By doing so directly, they have achieved things that their parents and professionals did not achieve. The requests have more weight when the active subjects of law make them. Today, self-advocates of Ecuador ask for things that perhaps nobody else would have considered necessary. For example, they want all professionals to speak direct with them, especially doctors. For that, they want medical appointment in the public health system to last longer, so doctors can explain them directly to them and in a simple language that occurs in their bodies, so that they can give informed consent for any procedure. They want the information to be more accessible, but not only require adapted text, they are being trained to be an easier to read text validation team. They want that if the things are going to be done, they, don't, uh, they, they will do well from the first moment. They do not want products or service, or service developed for them. They want to be part of their development and creation. Moreover, not only do they want more inclusion for themselves, they do not seek personal benefits. All are adults and are outside the educational system, but want a better education for children with intellectual disability. They, don't, they know that they didn't uh, not directly enjoy many of their achievements, but that does not matter, matter to them. They just want a more just society. Now they advise teachers on the proper way to reach their students with intellectual disability. They show the teachers how they learn and how make their classes more practical. The future of the project is uncertain. It will go there way, it will go to where they direct it. However, it has no turning back. Their image has already changed, and the challenges are now greater. Society has stopped seeing them as a children with good intentions. Now they see them as a men and women capable of dreaming and achieving their dreams. The state knows that this has an ally in this development if it is do things in the right way, and that it will be critics if it makes mistakes. Today, the self-advocates of Ecuador are consolidated as they go they are, people willing to make a better society for us. Uh, in summary, we uh, heard the, pe the people with intellectual disability and they say the things that they need. We say that the persons in Cambodia, our friends of Cambodia have the same problem, uh, all the, the work I have the same problem, but the only uh, solution is empowering the people with disability. They, don't, they only want an opportunity, and all the projects, I think, do only this. Give opportunities to the people, and they take this opportunity and do uh, great, great things. Thank you. Uh, actually, in terms of uh, self-advocacy, I think this is very impressive because, as we all know, self-advocacy is difficult as it stands, but self-advocacy in, in the world for people with learning difficulties, they are the last group to become self-advocates, even in, in, in Finland. 
I just reminiscent that all the organizations uh, committed to learning disabilities were founded within 1940s and 1950s, whereas the first organization where people with learning difficulties were themselves decision makers was founded in 2009. So we have this 50-year gap in terms of how we think about organizing. And now for the summary. Yeah, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> um, so another example from Ecuador. We, I'm just waiting for the camera to follow me, thank you. Um, so the focus, as uh, Thomas also said, um, is really on people with cognitive and learning disabilities. So that's a very particular and very good example. Um, the point is that people with uh, cognitive and learning disabilities are mostly not heard, uh, not only in, in Ecuador, but um, particularly there. So it is about being heard, being seen and being included. And what the project did was it trained people, um, it also trained people to be facilitators and it also taught, um, the project itself taught the people to speak for themselves, so to become a self-advocate. So self-advocacy is the main uh, focus of the whole project and the result was that there is again, a legally supported organization of people with learning uh, disabilities who actually are included in everything, in every decision-making, um, on, on all levels of um, governance. And what I heard as a summary is that we are part of the solution. Um, maybe that is an, a summary of, of the project, saying that people with learning disabilities are involved in everything, their dreams and wishes are being heard, and um, they're given an opportunity to be part of a society that is better for everyone. Thank you. And now, last but not the least, Mr. John Kelly from Source America. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Kelly, Vice President of Government Affairs and Public Policy for an organization named Source America. Uh, we're a national nonprofit agency in the United States uh, who focuses on employment for people with disabilities. Um, we work with about 400 other organizations across the nation uh, together employing about or providing employment for about 90,000 people with disabilities annually. Um, you know, this is framed as a participatory uh, session. So forgive me, I'm going to make you participate for, for just a minute and I'm going to do something that we do when we do advocacy training. One of, one of the questions that, that we ask the group is, who are you? And the answer is, I am somebody. So I'm going to ask you that question and I really hope people respond because otherwise I'm going to look silly on this Diaz with nobody responding to me. So who are you? I am All right, one person is somebody. Let, I'm going to give you another chance. Thank you though. Who are you? All right, that was pitiful, but I'm going to come back to it halfway through and I'm going to give you another chance to do better than that. Um, let, me, let me show you a short video and it's going to highlight why we ask that question and why we go that direction. It's also going to tell you a little bit about sort of what we believe as, as Source America. If the world could see what we see, they wouldn't overlook such a substantial resource. If more employers knew what we know, they'd jump at the chance to hire people with disabilities. And with good reason, because of the amazing work that people with disabilities do and how they do it. Consistent, outstanding quality, a can-do spirit, and an incomparable work ethic. Nuanced abilities that defy expectations and fulfill responsibilities. A dedicated resolve that brings us to work in snowstorms and lifts the spirits of co-workers in all weather, day in, day out. It comes from something that can't be taught or bought. A deep pride in a job well done. All of us, people with disabilities, community-based nonprofit agencies, Source America, the Ability One program, and our customers in the federal and private sectors form something greater than the sum of our parts. Let the world see what we see and know what we know. Then more people with disabilities will take their rightful place on the job and in the world.
So, so that video was called See What We See. And, and it really touches on something that I think in the, la the couch session Yoav talked about, which is focusing on ability and focusing on capability, not sort of the impressive mindset of focusing on what people can't do. Um, the reality, though, as, as we work with people from, from a, a self-representation, self-advocate perspective, is, is many of the people that come to us that we help train in advocacy, you know, have grown up in a country that, that ultimately they felt forgotten in, that, that they weren't as included as they could have been, and ultimately they get to a mindset that, that maybe they don't matter. And, and if there's one thing I know is you can't convince anybody that what you say matters and what you believe matters if you don't believe internally that you matter. So we spend a lot of time on this, making sure that people understand how important they are, how important their jobs are. You can see one of the pictures um, on, on this slide has a gentleman speaking, and behind him there's a banner that says, I am somebody. It becomes a mantra at our conference, and it's why we ask that question. So I'm going to give you another chance to do better than we did earlier. I'm going to ask you again, who are you? All right, that's a little better. I'm going to give you one more chance at the end of this presentation to make the room next door hear that we are somebody in this room. Um, so annually, we do a grassroots advocacy conference where we have about uh, 50 teams from all over the United States come in. Um, a team consists of an executive from a nonprofit agency. It consists of a self-representative or self-advocate. Um, and then it consists of a parent or family member um, from that, from that self-advocate or self-representative. Um, it's a very robust program. Uh, we have plenary sessions where everybody's one place at one time. We have members of Congress come and speak. Uh, we talk about policy issues. And we also have breakout sessions where individual groups can really focus on what they need to focus on in order to be successful. But, but make no mistake, the real ultimate focus of that conference is the self-representative and helping them to tell their story helping them be ready to go up to Capitol Hill and talk about what's important to them. Now, uh, let me frame the picture for you. In, in many cases, this may be the first time some of these individuals have been outside of their hometown. In most cases, it may be the first time they've been on an airplane, or the first time they've been in a hotel, or the first time they've been in Washington, DC. So this is an exciting time, but also a very stressful time um, for a lot of people, with all the things that are new and different. Um, after a full day of training, we give individual self-representatives an opportunity to come to the stage um, and talk about what's important to them and realize there's about 300 people in the room at this point. Um, and I'm always a little nervous that maybe this will be the year nobody wants to come up to the stage because many people are afraid of public speaking, but then always very excited because 70% of the people who we've trained throughout the day, after one day of training, come up to the front of the room and talk about what's important to them and talk about their story. Um, so it really is a transitional kind of event um, from that regard. Following that day is our largest Capitol Hill activation of the year. We do about 300, 400 visits with members of Congress um, on that day um, for self-advocates, self-representatives to talk about what's important to them and to talk about the policy issues that impact their lives. So an, an opportunity for them to really make a difference and have their voices heard. Um, it's not the only activation we do on Capitol Hill. We do things locally in states, and we also have action alerts where people can respond when important issues come up at any point in time. Um, an example of that, many of you know, I'm sure, our, our government was just closed for 35 days. Um, during that time period, through action alerts and other ways to communicate with our network, we had over 4,000 messages sent to Capitol Hill talking about the impact of that closure on the lives of people with disabilities, the people that are employed through the government, and encouraging the government to, to reopen. Um, so lots of work in, in that regard and lots of activation of individuals. Um, we also have a congressional champions program. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to have one of my friends, Senator Tom Harkin, here today, who was one of our strongest champions until he retired. We certainly miss you on Capitol Hill, sir. Um, but a, a champions program where members of Congress um, who believe in the abilities of people with disabilities, who believe disability employment is important, can play a role and, and also um, uh, be recognized for that. Um, very important because you build a relationship with a member in that fashion. Um, it really sets up opportunities for the self-representative to meet with them. So when we do have an issue and we need help with something, we're not then going for the first time to a member of Congress and they don't know who we are. It's that long-standing relationship that really gets things done. 
Um, we also have a suite of advocacy resources. I talked about action alerts. We do training across the nation uh, several different times a year. Um, we have web-based uh, applications. We have a, a mobile application all helping people to be more educated about telling their story, all helping them make it easier to communicate both with Capitol Hill and with the media um, in, in an easy fashion. I'm going to show you one more video here at the end, and then I'm going to give you one more chance to redeem yourselves as far as I am somebody. The video is going to focus on one of the gentlemen in this picture. His name is Calvin Franklin. Um, he's, a, he's an employee. Uh, he works at the, at, at the Senate office building, or the House office building, excuse me, and he's built a relationship with this member of Congress, um, Congressman Kennedy. He, he was invited to participate in the State of the Union, which if you don't know what the State of the Union is, it's the President of the United States, gives a speech once a year, you've got all of Congress, you've got the President's Cabinet, you've got the Supreme Court, everybody who's anybody politically is at this event. Calvin was invited to go as well, so let's watch this video. I am somebody, so when I mean I am somebody, that means I'm important, I'm powerful, I'm I got respect and honors and everything, so that's what it means to me. I am somebody. Goodwill, greater Washington for the people with learning disabilities. Um, get the right, have the right to, you know, work. John King is one of my favorites. You gotta, you gotta know who you, you gotta know how to have a connect with the senators. You know what I'm saying? You can't just walk up to a senator, see what I'm saying? When he walked up to me, I didn't know who he was, and he announced, he announced who he was, and I announced who I was. And ever since, we've just been good friends. So every time I, every time I see him, I speak to him, make sure he's all right, check up on him and stuff. Me and him, we had built the bond, and, and then he had took me to the State of the Union, so I was, I was real excited about when he took me to the State of the Union. It makes should be fair. Everything should be fair with us. I mean, we shouldn't, everybody shouldn't look at us in a different type of way. We should look at us as equal, just like anybody else. We human, just like anyone else. So I'll ask you one more time, who are you? I'm sorry, who are you? All right, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you all for your attention. I appreciate the opportunity to present. Yeah, wow, that was impressive and especially um, I think this tells you a little bit about now we are having the conference in Vienna, but when we talk about advancement in different fields on disability, employment is where we have succeeded the least. You look at majority of European countries, majority of disabled organizations, you have very few disabled people themselves participating as uh, self-advocates. At the same time, I think we're struggling. I think this really hits back to those who come from the states. Because in the US, due to the work done by people like, like Mr. Harkin, you have quite a wide access and you can focus then on the other areas, I think, in the content of employment. Here in European Union countries, I would especially like to highlight that one of the it's, it sounds weird, but one of the practical issues about getting disabled people to be self-advocates in terms of European politics is actually the inaccessibility of Brussels. We had a colleague who was employed by the European Parliament in Brussels and living in certain European capitals with severe mobility hindrance it might be next to impossible. So we are actually dealing with very, very pragmatic everyday life issues that then hinder the opportunities of disabled people themselves to participate in the top level, even though it doesn't sound rational. And now uh, for the summary. All right. So who are you? Exactly. Um, so what we saw here was a very nice example of another type of conference, or actually maybe quite similar to what we see here. Who knows? The point is that at the, it's a grass root at VEC, 
advocacy conference and the people are being trained to tell their story. And I heard that people are being trained to come up on stage and you're always surprised that people actually do come up on stage. And the effect is that voice, not only from, from being on stage, but the effect is that voices are being heard on Capitol Hill. So um, it's a direct connection to the upper uh, level of, of governance. And so um, people with disabilities develop their voice and they are being heard. It's all based on um, I am somebody, it's a can-do approach. So things we hear a lot in conferences like this, not looking at the disabilities, but the, the abilities and what can I do. And with your project, you also provide a lot of resources, education, web-based solutions, but also application-based solutions. So my summary would be um, to keep the flow of information going, and that's what it's all about. Information and exchange between those who know what their life is about and those who are supposed to do some politics on that. So maybe that's a circle. And um, from the last words is also what we heard today many times is employment is also key to inclusion. So that's the summary of the panel. Thank you. Yeah, and it also brings that it's all about showing some examples that I was, uh, when I attended a conference on disability and employment, one of the topics that has been raised within the European context has been that those organizations and those foundations who talk about disability and employment very rarely, if ever, have disabled people working within the organization. I think this is, this is something that's more improved in the, in the US. And then someone replied that, well, we are a small employer, we don't change the world. But then I think it's a little bit about the moral authority that unless you are yourself willing to hire a disabled individual, unless you are yourself willing to show example, then you do not have the moral authority to speak on the whole issue. I think it's a little bit the same with all of the great phenomena. Uh, we have time, if someone we have possibility for a few minutes if someone in the audience would like to present a question to the panelist. You can do a show of hands. Yes, and can someone deliver a, yeah. Do you have a microphone? Can we? Hi, Jennifer Mizrahi from Respectability. Um, six men on a panel. Um, where are the women in your organizations and what do you do to empower women with disabilities? That's actually a very good talk. Actually, in my organization, both the director and the chair are women, so I'm, I'm, I'm innocent of this. So <laughs> I completely wash my hands, so um, we can have a round, okay. A very good point. Just to say something, for example, in, the, in this uh, document, we mentioned first women and then men. Mm -hmm. It's very important to work in the in gender issues in our project. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jennifer, good to see you. Um, you're familiar with our organization. About half of our senior leadership team is female. In addition, if you look at my government affairs team, it's, I'd have to do the math in my head, but I think it's 80 or 70 percent skewed women towards men. Um, also, and, and someone had talked about this earlier, not to switch from the women topic too far, but disability representation, especially in a government affairs team, also very important as we talk about sort of nothing about us without us. Um, also, a, a good proportion of my team, 50 percent, is, is individuals with disabilities as well. Hi, thanks for the very uh, um, uh, good observation from the panel. Uh, from, from our organization in, in Cambodia, um, someone was meant to come um, to represent who was a, a, a woman but wasn't able to come last minute. We, we do try as hard as we can. We have inclusion not just with disability but with, with gender but then it, it, it doesn't always happen. I mean you just look and make the observation you've made today, it doesn't always happen. We, we try. but. Thank you. Uh, in our organization, we have 50% uh, of uh, the total uh, staff are women, and uh, 50 of the 50 are women with disability. 
Yeah, so we mean have been promoted in our organization. Yeah, thank you. Uh, here in um, the Cambodian practice, uh, you mentioned that uh, the local group are, have uh, adequate engagement in the policy making. And what is the strategy if uh, the local government has some policy to engage people with disability for local development plan? And does it support uh, the achievements of sustainable development goals? Uh, could we get the question again? Okay, I would like to know about the Cambodian practice. Uh, as the presenter mentioned that uh, there is the adequate engagement of the people with disability in the local development uh, initiatives. So if uh, there is some strategy of the local government to engage people in the local development plan so that the sustainable development goals can be supported, leaving no one behind. Thank for the question. Um, by the project support, uh, yeah, this is the third year of the project support, but uh, we supported by uh, uh, Life for the World. And we are very, very appreciated that uh, the advocacy has been uh, taken place into account and people with disability um, has been integrated in commune and district investment plant. Because of the projects, we got a uh, uh, very high percentage of a person with disability has been uh, uh, taken into account in their development plan. Uh, may I um, answer or respond to your question? Hi, I have a question for John, John Kelly. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tamara Cunningham. I'm from New Jersey City University, and I oversee the international program there. I have a kind of an um, ideological question for you because I'm very impressed by the grassroots advocacy conference. Um, I do have a question on how you define um, disability. We find that it kind of uh, extends beyond maybe the normal definitions that are being used because uh, historically marginalized groups could have other types of disabilities like fear of politics, for example. And I'm wondering, one, uh, what, uh, how do you extend invitations to those who attend the conference, number one, who gets invited, so that definition of disability. Um, and in particular, I'm, I'm just thinking about the black young man who was in that video and uh, the black young faces that I see at my university and, and my wanting to get them to travel abroad and have these kinds of experiences in addition to other students with disabilities. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure, thank, thank you for the question and thank you for being the first to jump in with the, with the I am somebody. Um, so the, the sort of initial cut for, for who's invited to our conference is members of our network. Um, we've got, as I said, 400 organizations across the nation that are members of our network. That's the pool from which people are invited. Um, when you talk about definition of disability and, and how it's defined, um, we utilize primarily the definition that's involved with the Ability One program, which is a program we work on behalf of. So um, it deals with having a medical diagnosis of disability, and then on our side of the program also um, the, the, the evaluation that the individual is not competitively employable. It's not a definition necessarily that we're in love with because again, we don't want to constantly talk about what somebody can't do, but it's the definition we have right now between regulation and statute that we have to use. Um, I, I think there's some movement to try and change that definition and frame it in a different way. Um, but that, that's how it's defined um, for us and for our program at this point. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we are actually coming to close, so we do not have time for uh, any more questions within the official panel framework. But I really, I, I like to thank everyone from attending, and especially our. Uh, so especially for the summaries, because I think this is a very good concept in these kind of events. Someone steps in the room at the middle of the panel. Thank you.